Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know that we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Proverbs, and it's a series for the months of January, February, and March of 2015. This is lesson number six in that series for February 7 of 2015, and it's entitled, What You Get Is Not What You See. I think that didn't sound right, does it? Well, don't we say, you get what you see? What you see is what you get? Well, why is that not true? And that will be our challenge in Proverbs 14, 15, and maybe some of 16. Did you, did you make this title up, or is that the title of the... <laughs> no, this is the this title, is the title of the title in the quarterly? Yeah. Okay, well, we need to get into it. Let's have a word of prayer to get started. Our wonderful Father, we're so thankful that you have given us guidance which isn't deceitful, that is fairly clear and plain in most cases. We have the record of the Bible, we have the record of Christian history, we have the record of nature, we have the writings of Ellen White, which we appreciate greatly. Help us not to be deceived by the subtle arguments of the devil. May we be wise in the definition that's given us here in these chapters in Proverbs is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> What's the difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom? They're both wisdom. What's the difference between <laughs> human wisdom and divine wisdom? Is one's there human and one's divine. Okay. <laughs> is, is there a difference except one is greater in depth than the other? Well, I think the obvious thing that I would like to suggest is that we humans can be deceived so easily. All you have to do is go to a magic show or watch it. I mean, some, every, every once in a while I hear there's going to be some famous magician on television. I, I like to watch them just to realize, it helps me to realize how easily we can be fooled. Now, why did you go to deception when you talked about difference in, the, in wisdom? Why did you go to deception? Well, because God is not deceived. Yes. Divine wisdom is never deceived. But, but we can person, be so easily deceived. If a person is learning, he's gaining wisdom. That means he hasn't got it yet. Does that mean he's a sinner? Yeah. Well, he's, he's, a, he's not mature yet. He's not perfect. I know, but we're sure. all like that. Even if we hadn't... The human yeah. race hadn't ascended. I mean, we would have been born. We would have gained in wisdom. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have the wisdom at that time, does that mean we're being deceived? Yeah, just because we're ignorant, are we lost? No, 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 no. Oh, we have the biblical, pro or the biblical parables that Jesus gave, you know, about the, there's a seed and it sprouts into that little green tinus single leaf like this and then it goes up and eventually it produces harvest but that also implies let's think about that it's beautiful we in the farmer loves nothing more than walk out there and there's his field everything sprouting there's this this thin layer of green it's beautiful why is that if it stayed just like that would we be happy would he be happy no not at all the reason he's happy with that crop and the reason Jesus used that as a parable is what? It's, it's a harbinger of what's going to happen. That crop keeps growing. Uh, it, and, it, and it produces a great harvest. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's so, so define sorry. wisdom. Well, that's a tough one. I'm just, I'm just wondering why you separated wisdoms as one being deception when you can have a lack of wisdom because you, ha you don't know enough yet. What I'm trying to suggest is that human wisdom is, is, is incomplete. God's wisdom is complete. And because human wisdom is incomplete, we can be deceived. I'm just trying to give that as a possibility. But isn't but wi human wisdom has its value, because yeah. look at the world as it is today from the way God gave it. Men have done tremendous work, tremendous. Even when I pick up the cell phone and my brother is in France and I can hear his voice as he was standing close to me, 
I am awed. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, men have done Amazing. something. Yes. So I understand what human wisdom is fallible because we don't have all the answers. Okay, l let, me, let me illustrate your point. Everything we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch, those are the five senses, is interpreted in our brains based on our previous experiences. Based upon our wisdom. That's our wisdom. As a result, if some information is presented that does not fit easily with what our current thinking is, we often reject it without even taking a second thought. But not always. Not always. I, I didn't say always, I said often. This is especially true when it comes time to judge our own behaviors. 96% of Americans interviewed a few years ago believed they would go to heaven. Only 4% thought they, they might go to hell. So, are you espousing a certain element of pessimism here that those 96% of the people are all deceived and they aren't going to be there? Well, if Are you, you proposing? If, if you read scripture and if you read uh, yeah. the writings of Ellen White, it doesn't seem to come out like that. Maybe we're closer to the 144,000 than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's not go there. <laughs> Well, let's think of some modern examples of the fact that we have only a limited view of reality. Well, God's, God's view of reality is total and complete, I, I believe. We have a very limited view of reality. And some examples, can we see x-rays? Do we believe they exist? Well, you've seen an x-ray before. Well, we, we, I, I've seen, yeah, I've seen a, the film. A, a film that records some what x-rays yeah. did. I can't see the x-rays. Isn't that the proof that there's x-rays? Oh, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm asking you, I'm, that's what I'm asking. Not there are things that are real that you can't see, but they are real. Well, that doesn't prove that they're real. Because there were, for example, the, the concept of a flat earth, or the concept that, which is better, is that, uh, is that uh, everything revolves around the earth. There was plenty of evidence that we used mm. to prove that there was plenty of evidence but uh, so just because the x-ray manifests we believe that, that the that our theory is manifested in this way it, we're drawing that conclusion but it, it may be an erroneous conclusion okay so but but my point is it's still real even if you think the universe is, is, is orbiting around the earth you still have a universe, you still have an earth, and you still have evidence. Now, we have misinterpreted the evidence in that case, but it's still evidence, and it's still there. The movements of the planets didn't change just because someone misinterpreted it. See? Yeah, now, we now, don't misinterpret anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe on your side of the table. <laughs> so how can we, I mean, but this is serious. We can joke about it, but it's serious. How can we avoid especially deceiving ourselves. Don't look shocked like that. This section of the book of Proverbs will give us some good ideas. We need to live by faith and not merely by sight. What does that mean? Can't count on the evidence. No. I don't <laughs> if we cannot be sure about what we can actually see, in light of the traditional statement, seeing is believing, how can we believe in things that we can't even see? Well, you have to make a decision on the Word of God, whether you believe it or not. I mean, it's a decision you have to make. We're okay, off an esoteric subject here tonight. Well, okay, well no, no, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Let me give a good example, okay? There are people who fall into real depression, okay? And... I've been fortunate not to have had a lot of trouble with depression, but some people do, and sometimes they feel better and sometimes they feel worse, okay? On the times when they're feeling really bad, it may seem like, you know, even they like to take their lives. Things are really in bad shape. They don't, they're not happy about it. But if they're Christians, they can say, God's word is sure. I believe it, even if I don't feel like it. I can get attest to that completely. After mm -hmm. I had my hysterectomy, I didn't get started on estrogens right away. And 
it was like day four after surgery. And I called Gordon. I was at home feeling fine, but I was in the state of depression that I sat out on the porch and I thought, why am I here? I don't need to be here. Why? You know, and I realized what was going on because I had enough knowledge to understand it. And I thought, if I was one of those people that lives on the line between depression and non-depression, I wouldn't be here today. I was that depressed and a little medication, I was fine. Mm -hmm. But it became so real to me how depression works mm -hmm. and how uh, your perception of life is totally different. Now, part of the reason, thank you, Myra, for that. <clears throat> part of the reason why that's possible is because our brains are not capable of processing all reality. We, we, we tend to focus on certain things. And if you focus on the wrong things or the wrong emotions at a given time, you can fall into a real depression. You can fall into all kinds of stuff. You can, you can believe nonsense if you, if you follow somebody who's teaching nonsense. People have taken their lives or allowed somebody else to take their lives because they thought that was the right thing to do. I can give one more example to that. I grew up in a small town, and as Loma not Linda... as small as my town, I'm sure. Probably not, but it, it was pretty small. But like Loma Linda, we had skunks. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when I was probably in third grade, I walked out, and everybody goes, oh, that skunk last night was awful. I says, what are you talking about? What skunk? I didn't smell skunk. And I said, you didn't... St I was convinced they were teasing me terribly because I did not smell a skunk. It was not until I married Gordon and lived in Loma Linda and we had a skunk outside the door. I can't smell a skunk. Mm. It's a blessing and it, it's a blessing to me. I have now learned the smell, but I still can't pick it up to begin with. And it was that, you know, you can be totally deceived by something other than reality. Okay, let's, let's jump into the book of Proverbs. We're going to look at Proverbs 14. <laughs> and look, and we're going to look, what does this chapter tell us about fools? So, let, let me, I'm going to read a few verses, and then we're going to talk about what, we don't have time to read the whole chapter. Homes are made by the wisdom of women, but are destroyed by foolishness. Be honest, and you show that you have reverence for the Lord. Be dishonest, and you show that you do not. Proud fools talk too much. The words of the wise protect them. Without any oxen to pull a plow, your barn will be empty, but with them it will be full of corn. A reliable witness always tells the truth, but an unreliable one tells nothing but lies. Conceited people can never become wise, but intelligent people learn easily. Stay away from foolish people. They have nothing to teach you. Why is a clever person wise? Because he knows what to do. Why is a stupid person foolish? Because he only thinks he knows. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. That's yeah. a little bit of flavor of it. highlighted here, too. <laughs> you had some highlighting in there, too? Yeah, the same, same Yeah. Words. Well, so, number one, like Satan, the originator of sin, the selfish fool speaks proudly. We know that example. The f two... The fool readily mocks wisdom, which he chooses not to accept. Can you think of anyone you know that refuses to accept some truth that you know is truth, but they mock it because they don't want to accept it? We Adventists often talk about people who refuse to accept the Sabbath when we know that the Sabbath is right, based on Scripture. These kind of people may, see, may profess to seek wisdom, but they will reject out of hand ideas such as the fact that God created our world. Some people even mock the idea of sin. The fool is easily deceived. Proverbs 14, 15. Critics who mock the truths of the Bible turn around and accept some of the most incredible things. They actually believe that it might have been possible for life to develop purely by chance alone given billions of theoretical years. Four, the fool is often impulsive, Proverbs 14, 16 and 29. In his pride, the fool often thinks that he knows what is best and does not need to take time to think things through. He reacts quickly and mostly by impulse alone. 
Have you ever had that experience? Make an impulsive decision to do something. And, oh no, why, why did I do that, right? Five, the fool makes fun of and oppresses others. Proverbs 14, verses 21 and 31. Fools who are so certain that they are right are intolerant of others with different ideas and they love to treat them with contempt. There's uh, signs being posted in some parts of our country making fun of Christmas and making fun of Christians. It's the Christmas season put up by the Atheist Society of America. You think those people are wise? They think they're wise. Well, not from our angle, that's for sure. <laughs> well, <clears throat> would you say that you... Uh, don't, don't, don't comment about this. Do we all sometimes make foolish mistakes? While we may feel quite confident to identify foolish thinking behavior in others, how good are we at recognizing foolish behavior in ourselves? Can you think of a specific instance when you or someone you know personally acted like one of the fools mentioned above? I'll ask you people out there in the audience so you can, you can, you can think about that one too. Well, in contrast to foolishness in the book here of Proverbs, here are some ideas about wisdom. One, the wise person speaks with humility. Okay, Proverbs 14, 3. Those who are wise are always prepared to learn. They are not quick to judge. They consider carefully other people's ideas and they listen carefully when people present them. How often do you see people having discussions and people are saying, uh, let me think about that carefully before I respond, or yeah, da 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 da. You know, you know how often do we we, we the, the the responses and anyway, I think you all know what I'm talking about. Depends Number how, two depends on how wrong they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> two, the wise to value the learning of knowledge, the the value the learning and knowledge that they have. Proverbs fourteen six and eighteen. The wisest people in the world are those who recognize how much there is still to learn. While the fool thinks he already knows everything that he needs to know, the wise are constantly seeking to learn more. And I will tell you a foolish example in my case. As Myra says, she grew up in a small town. I grew up in a very small town. There was a little lad in a school there. And there were, I don't know, maybe 50 books in our library or something like that in this little school. And I had read, by the time I graduated from the eighth grade, I would read every one of those books maybe two, three times. And I thought, you know, I, I know just about everything there is to know. And when I got to high school, got to academy, went to boarding academy, I thought, you know, there's a few more things out there that I don't understand. <laughs> and by the time I got to the end of college and got to the end of medical school, I said, how in the world am I going to be able to understand just even this little piece of medicine? So. I think that one of the most important things we learn from higher education is how much we don't know. So what do you think foolishness means? Does it mean that they're stupid? Does it mean Some that they're... Some are just stupid. They're just stupid? Or does it mean <laughs> that their um, emotions are. are higher than Uneducated. higher than the value of... There's other Reason? people. There's other people have such a high opinion of themselves that they think they couldn't be wrong. I think it's one of those English words that has many shades of meaning. <laughs> the fool. Um, the fool. Well, number three in my series: the wise are careful and cautious. Proverbs fourteen fifteen: the wise person clearly understands the issues in the great controversy between God and Satan. He knows that sin and evil exist. He does everything possible to avoid giving Satan the least possible advantage in his life. And he does his best to identify as quickly as possible any temptation to evil. Four, the wise keep their cool. They do not need to become excessively excited when different ideas are presented because they look to the wisdom from above and they have learned to exercise self-control and more than that, they're willing to learn if it proves that something that somebody else said is right, 
They're willing to learn from the experiences of others. And five, finally, the wise are compassionate and sensitive, Proverbs 14, 21, and 31. The wise recognize that they have a relationship with God vertically and at the same time have important horizontal relationships with their brothers and sisters around the world. So are all those things that can be achieved? Well, these are things that are presented in this chapter anyway. But can they be achieved? Yeah, I think so. So th there's a point where you'll never get mad, you'll never get upset, you'll never hit, get your blood pressure up over mm -hmm. some argument. Do you think people will be like that when they're in heaven? Well, I'm not sure because God... <laughs> Boy, because God hold on. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't know what God <laughs> has put into us. Yeah. Uh, we don't know if these emotions are from sin or are they from... The Lord put them in it to us to make life more, more of a bouquet. Well, yes. So, um, so we're going to have cranky people in heaven to make life more of a bouquet there. Well, maybe with. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say that would go off the edge or anything, but you never know. Question. Yes. Jesus, we all agree Jesus is wise and was wise and did not sin. However, at the, when he went to the temple, he got upset, he got angry, and also when he walked over and he was hungry and he walked to the fig tree and the tree had no fruit and he was angry and he cursed the tree. What was that? I, uh, his wisdom means, uh, you know, so utopia, we're wonderful, we hear all the time, or does it have varying yeah, different things in it? Yeah, like when somebody tortures a Mm. little kid or something, you just look at it and say, you know, I'm a no. saint and that's just too bad. I say, I'm glad I'm not God. <laughs> when those <laughs> things happen, yeah, that's what I think. You're lucky I'm not God. Well, Ellen White wrote in the Review and Herald on April 8 of 1841, first paragraph, we do not realize how many of us walk by sight and not by faith. We believe the things that are seen, but do not appreciate the precious promises given us in His Word. So what does that mean? What does it mean to walk by sight? Or, I mean, do it either way. Walk by faith and not by sight. Or, or what does it mean to walk by sight and not by faith? Is it easy to trust God's Word and move forward even when we cannot see how things will work out? Oh. Tough. You get in a bad situation, uh, whether it be a family issue, uh, divorce, uh, whatever, to see the, when you're in the present, you know, you can look back at situations that you've gone through. You think, well, you know, I made it through that. But at the time when you're going through it, it just doesn't seem like there's yeah. any solution. Yeah. Well, I, when I run across those situations, I like to think of this quotation. It's taken from Desire of Ages, page 330, paragraph 1. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, he has his way prepare, prepared to bring relief. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Now, it might take a while for that to happen. But I, if, I, if, I, if I'm struggling with something, I say, okay, I'm going to step forward in faith. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, I know that God has a plan here, and I know that he has a thousand ways to work things out. But you are not sitting idle no just waiting for things to work out no you are you are active in trying to work work well the words would be work it out yourself the proper words would be moving forward by faith work In things faith. out as as god is leading you to yes. to participate but just to sit around and and 
and no. wait and to think. But you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes that's that you have to do that too. Yeah. Well, you, you need to think about things before you move forward. We've talked about being cautious. It's hard, to, it's hard to look at these hypotheticals. When you yeah. look at something specific, well, then it's kind of a little easier to... Yeah. Well, sinners love to do things in the dark. They think that if they are more or less out of the sight of other human beings, they can do as they like. <coughs> they need to understand that the, quote, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good, Proverbs 15, verse 3. Are you comfortable with that idea? Yes. That everything you do all the time, day and night, God is watching you? Well, for God's friends, that's probably good news. For sinners, especially those who recognize God's existence, it may be scary. Well, that may be one reason why they want to separate from him. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah there's no question about the fact. The, the people who developed the theory of evolution and all that kind of stuff and rebelled against the, the, the Catholic Church in, in, you know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's exactly. They did that because they were tired of having the thumb on what they believed, what the church taught them. God is going to judge you. He's going to condemn you if you do this. And they're saying, I'm sorry, I'm not going to accept that anymore. And their way of responding was, get rid of the idea of God. Not, not let's, let's, let's straighten things out in the church like they should have, but get rid of God. Well, the next two chapters, I, I wish we had time to read these, Proverbs 15 and 16, take on a more theological bent. There are plenty of passages in Scripture suggesting that God sees and knows and understands everything. For example, look at Psalm 33, 18. And I might add, one that we don't have here is, Psalm 139 that says he knew everything about us even before we were born. But here's 3318. The Lord watches over those who obey him, those who trust in his constant love. That's pretty clear, right? And look at Job 28. Look at uh, verses 24 and 28 here. Because he sees the ends of the earth, sees everything under the sky. No place you can go to get away from God. God, and now verse 28, God said to the human beings, to be wise you must have reverence for the Lord, to understand you must turn from evil. How different would our lives be if every day we practice the presence of God? We talked about that back near the beginning of the series of lessons. Practicing the, pre what do we mean when we say practicing the presence of God? Bacon it? Faking it. <laughs> uh, practice. Uh, how about there's no way you actually can, do it. There's no way you can fake the presence of God. God's, <laughs> yeah, pre God's presence is there whether you try to fake it or not. The question is, do you recognize it? If, when you're practicing for a speech, you know, you're doing it in front of a fake audience. Okay. So that's, that's what hit me when you said practice. Right. <laughs> well, Unfortunately, sinners tend to think that if they can avoid any human detection of their sin, then they've gotten away with it. Is that a good plan? No, but it's not good either to always be afraid that, ooh, I better not do that. God's watching me. Yeah. That's, that's not good either. Yeah. yeah. We talked about that last week. It leads to a bad attitude toward God. And I read Hebrews 4, verse 13, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of, wh of him to whom we must give account. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, or do you, wish, do you wish you could go behind a bush once in a while and God couldn't <laughs> see you anymore? I'm in real quick. <laughs> uh, does Genesis 6 question God's omnipresence? Genesis 6, 5 to begin with where it says God regretted mm -hmm. creating people. No. Okay. I, that's that's a, a, a discussion that needs to take maybe some time. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that God knew exactly what was coming 
before it even before he created Adam and Eve, before he created Satan, he knew what was coming. But he realized that he, he has to allow freedom. He knew what the constant consequences were going to be. He recorded it all in detail so that the universe can learn and he doesn't have to go through this ever again. But I think he also lived through the moment. Yes. And that's the response. Yeah. I believe God could. I believe that too. But me, I believe there's some, well, some interpretation of God is not right. Oh, I yeah. think sometimes we miss the mark. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, in Proverbs 15, we also find that there's quite a few verses that talk about cheer and joy. Proverbs 15, 13, for example, in the New American Standard Bible says, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. Or my Good News Bible, which says, when people are happy, they smile. <clears throat> That's pretty clear, right? Jesus himself said, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew 6, verse 34. Despite the troubles that Christians may face, we can choose to how to respond to them. Pain, suffering, and trials need not conquer us. We have a Heavenly Father who guarantees us that we will not be tempted more than we are able to bear. Do you, do you all feel that you've been able to demonstrate that in your own lives? <coughs> or do you it's sometimes... It's courage, though, in the time when you think... I just can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. To think of that, that God won't give me more than I can take. Yeah. So it's comfort. Well, what about this comment from Acts chapter 20, verse 34? There's more happiness in giving than in receiving. Now, there's quite a bit of that in this section of Proverbs, but there's a summary in a, one verse. Is it true that there's more happiness? Maybe this is a good question for Christmas time, right? <laughs> there's more happiness in giving than in receiving? I think every mother would say yes to that, to uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But I'll, I'll receive as well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, God will give you whatever you need to do the right thing regardless of the magnitude of the temptation. That would be my interpretation of that pas last passage. Okay. Boy, that can be an awful lot of stuff. Um, that can be an awful big tool, mm -hmm. so to speak. Is it possible that tool can be so big that you can't handle it right now? Yes. So. Well, it's interesting that that's a quotation from Paul, and he says he's quoting Jesus. Where is it found? It's not there. Not there. <laughs> Here we have Luke quoting Paul in a sermon, and he's quoting Jesus, but we can't find the quotation in the writings of it, uh, the, the record. And what does that teach us about inspiration? Just to take a little detour. There's a lot of information that we don't know anything about. Right? Well, it's like what John said at the end of the book. If, yeah. if everything was written down, a uh, whole world wouldn't hold all the books. Yeah, that, exactly. That Jesus. Well, did. shouldn't we be cheerful and happy because we know for certain that God loves us? Is that a fact or are we just pretending? Gary, you're talking about pretending? Is, is, is that a fact? Mm -hmm. Well, how do, you, how do you reach that fact? That's, that, that's what I asked you. No, you just asked that you got to do it somehow. <laughs> so, do you have any questions about in that in your own mind? Uh, how to reach the um, the fact that how do, God's worth loving? How would loving? we determine that God loves us? How do you determine that God loves us? Well, there's there's a lot of things that make you put it together. You have parents, hopefully, that love you. Mm -hmm. You've got good consequences that can come out of different things and who's associated with what and all those things that's how it comes if my life is easy and trouble free 
-hmm. and I have no burdens. That's the only time I can be sure that God loves me? Well, better not be. According to the last lesson, with all the blessings and stuff. Well, <laughs> you, well, you're going to go back to Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28, huh? We do know that there's trouble. There's trouble happening here. Mm -hmm. And there is a conflict. Well, in our How last do we find lesson, that out? In our last lesson, we read 2 Timothy 3.12. All who want to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will do what? Suffer persecution. <clears throat> All of everybody? Well, if God loved me, he wouldn't make me go through that. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't really like believe that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, look well, at Proverbs. There's, there's some truth to that statement. You just have to understand. What's going on? Well, look at Proverbs 20, verse 24. The Lord has determined our path. How then can anyone understand the direction his own life is taking? So does that mean God has set things up and we're going to go that way whether we like it or not? Well, let, let's look, look at the next chapter. We, chapter. Haven't, haven't, we haven't answered how we know that God mm -hmm. loves us. Oh, <laughs> I suppose you think I'm going to answer it. <laughs> well... <laughs> I thought all these allowed, questions were... I'm not allowed to ask any questions that I can't answer? Socratarian or something like that? Socratic? Yeah. <laughs> you're not going to get understand the, about God's love if you don't spend some time in the book. I mean, you're yeah. not going to get it from, yeah, from really. your ex externally except via this, I think. Well, you, once, once you've read the Bible, you might get some ideas. A beautiful flower. I mean, why does a rose have to not only be beautiful but smell good? Why does it have thorns that mm -hmm. prickle your finger and cause it to bleed? You know what a thorn is? It's a it's sharp a, thing. Look at that tree <laughs> outside. Yeah, I, I know, but oh, yeah. a thorn is a very slight DNA modification of a leaf. Oh, the, the, did everybody, does everybody know that? Well, you think I, Abraham people, knew that? <laughs> a lot of people don't, but it's something we need to know. Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk about love, do you, if you're sitting on the step in a timeout, do you think about your, does mom love me? Yeah. Well, God's mm -hmm. kind of like that. Yeah. There's times when you're going to wonder. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about the rose thing. It probably depends what you concentrate on, too, whether you look at the thorns or you look at the beauty of the flower. Well, I, uh, my favorite rose is called a double delight. It's not only mm. beautiful, but the smell is just unbelievable. Mm. It's just fantastic. We have one growing in our backyard. Is there any thorns? It has some thorns. Mm. You had to think, so you probably weren't looking for them. I wanted to make sure I <laughs> recalled in my mind that the yes, it does. <laughs> well, does God know the future? Does he know for sure that sin's going to come to an end? Does he know for sure that he's preparing a heavenly place for us? Does he know it's going to come for an end in my life? He does. That's why he's God. Does that mean we don't have any choice left? Well, what he knows is what ended up being our choice. I see. Now think about it. Very cool. Yeah, Asking yeah, these, <laughs> I mean, these he, questions again. and the, in, in the Bible... In Daniel particularly, and in, in Revelation, places like that, God predicts things thousands of years in the future. How can he do that? And of course, Isaiah 40 to 55 <laughs> asks that question. He says, if you, and he's talking about people are worshiping all these stones and, and metal images and wooden idols and so forth. He says, okay, you God, stand up over there. Tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, predict the future if you can do it. If you think you're a god, it's, he really he really lays into him. It's 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 all it's you have to smile a little bit. You know, God says, <laughs> I can predict the future, what can you do? Well in Proverbs sixteen, verse one, we're told, We may make our plans, but God has the last word. What does that mean? Well, it's like the truth. The truth like the has soldier, his last word. 
like the soldier who said, whenever I argue with my commanding officer, I always have the last word? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think God right? sees all the deviations we're going to make on the way. Yeah. He knows where it's going to end up. Yeah. Well, if we're willing to cooperate with God, He will direct and establish our plans. This is all in Proverbs chapter verse 16, uh, chapter 16, and work for us even among our enemies. The one key is to cooperate with God in all that we do. We really believe God can do that for us. Well, look at Proverbs 16, 18, and 19. This is a fairly familiar passage. Sometimes it takes a lot of faith to believe that. Pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. You know, pride goes before a fall. It is better to be humble and stay poor than to be one of the arrogant and get a, a share in their loot. What about those verses? Are they true? Do you, have you found them to be true in your own experience? Does it loot mean that they stole it? Yes. Right. Well, nobody has any questions about that? Wasn't pride the first sin? Is that why... Pride goes, is really close to selfishness, isn't it? Is that why Jesus so, so strongly urged his disciples to seek humility instead? Remember he called the small child and he said, if you really want to be first in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be like this child. Well, look at Proverbs 16, verse 33. We're working our way here through it. People cast lots to learn God's will, but God himself determines the answer. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to ask you that question. Cast the lots, and we're trying to figure it out, and then he makes the lots roll around the right way so that... Well, didn't that happen several times in the Bible? Well, yeah. Casting lots worked fine to pick out Achan and his family as the guilty ones. Was God controlling... Did God control the lots every time? Well, I'm asking you. <laughs> No, this time I asked. You asked first. <laughs> well, we really know what casting lots was? Oh, no, we don't. I didn't think we did. We don't even know for sure how they cast lots. Oh, it's some kind of a gamble, though. It's a chance type. It yeah. to be. Well, if you believe everything is providential, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a good way to do it, especially if you don't have any idea where to go. Yeah. You might as well flip a coin and go this way or that way. Yeah. Open the book and put your finger down, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What What is he really saying with that? You know, we say Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. There's something deeper here that we're we're looking. Well, around. some very simple examples. You, I'm sure you've all seen <coughs> kids playing King of the Mountain. You know, and everybody's trying to push you off the top, and you can. You, I'm sure you've all seen the the kid up there. I'm the king of the mountain. Well, guess what happens next? <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's it's, it's what, a very simple example. What but. Solomon's saying here is that we, we cast lots or we, we do things to try and figure out how things well, should go. Should, I mean, if casting lots works so well in the Bible, shouldn't we do that today? Figure out how to cast lots and then you don't have to make any decisions yourself. You just cast a lot. I mean, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, they had the Urim and the Thummim. Well, maybe that's what Solomon is saying. Humans have a tendency to dink around here with these lots when, you know, go to the Lord for your answers. Okay. Ask the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Don't go back to the Greek to try and figure out what the Bible says. Ask <laughs> the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, well, if, well, you, if you well, do something like cast lots and you say that the Lord's going to do it and they, you take a lot, then you end up doing having to do something stupid, who's to say that down the line sometime, way down there, that it doesn't turn out to be the right thing? Well, and here's, here's would be my point. You know, some people would say, why don't, we, why don't we 
all pray and why don't we do this and this and this to desert, decide who should be our next pastor or should maybe the general conference president or the conference president, something like that. And there's an area of mathematics called the laws of probability. Yes. I haven't been. God's behind that. Well, yeah, I mean, there is. really is a field in that area. Yeah. How do we know taking votes isn't casting lots? Maybe it is. But the difference is this, and I, I would point this out. God is asking us. God takes a lot of responsibility. But he asks us to take responsibility in place so we can take responsibility. So if we pick somebody to do a certain job and they do a lousy job, if we pick them, then we know we did a lousy job. If God picks them, who are we going to blame? <laughs> <laughs> and they do a lousy job? And they do a lousy job. God picks them and they do a lousy job. Who do we blame? How about King Saul? Yeah. But it was God exercised his prerogative of choosing. Yeah. Well, let me read you these words from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 720, paragraph 3. From the beginning, Satan has portrayed to men the gains to be won by transgression. Thus he seduced angels. Thus he tempted Adam and Eve to sin. And thus he is still leading multitudes away from obedience to God. The path of transgression is made to appear desirable, quote, but the end thereof are the ways of death, end quote, Proverbs 14, 12. Happy are they who, having ventured in this way, learn how bitter are the fruits of sin and turn from it betimes. Nothing tends to, and I'm reading on now, this is Ministry of Healing, page 251, nothing tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontent, discontented thoughts and feelings as much a duty as it is to pray. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a bench of mourners groaning and complaining all along the way to our Father's house? Those professed Christians who are constantly complaining, who seem to think cheerfulness and happiness is a sin, have no have not genuine religion. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Good thing to think, to notice, huh? Like that. Boy, that doesn't sound like Elijah to me. <laughs> Why not? Well, I don't know. <clears throat> it seems like he showed up with some not so cheery, happy messages sometimes, and it. Yeah. Seems like there's, I'm just using him as an example. It, about Isaiah and Jeremiah. Doesn't sound like they were waltzing around the no. town with all these lovely little cheery, positive, <laughs> <laughs> well, happy, what do you do? non melancholy thoughts. What do you do when you know things are going from bad to worse? You're melancholy. Just As the opposite of what that says to be. I see. As we suggested at the beginning of our lesson, one of the major contrasts in this lesson is between our wisdom and God's wisdom. Let's see if we can say a little bit more about that. Are there ever times in your life when you think you know what is best, maybe even better than God does? Never. I never do that. You never do that? No. So the, you never the, commit a sin? Mess, no, no. What, I just know that I probably got the wrong idea of what God wants to do. That's about the only thing. But I never, I have never in my life thought I could do something better or make a better decision than God. There's no way. Well, How could anybody when, think that? Every Some people time might. Gary always you, believes he's doing the Lord's will. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, I'm you. just saying I never, I never, I never think that I can do something better than what God has told me to do. So when you go marching off on these tirades, what are you thinking? What tirades? <laughs> I don't know. You, <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be <laughs> there's got to be some some kind of a tirade somewhere. We all have tirades. Well, so I'm, when I'm you not, take I'm off, I'm on, not thinking about God when I go on those tirades. <laughs> He's kind of somewhere else at that time. I unfortunately. Well, okay. <laughs> let's, let's let's ask this. Let's look at this question seriously. <laughs> When we commit sin, at least when we knowingly commit sin, aren't we saying, I know better what I want to do right now than God does? 
or what I should do right now than God does. No, I'm just saying that it won't be quite as bad as, as it appears it's going to be. <laughs> who, who thinks that deeply? <laughs> <clears throat> well, we've talked about the fallibility of our perceptions. Well, look, we have the biblical records. We have the writings of Ellen White, a Seventh-day Adventist. Are these, are these sources reliable? Are they dependable? Some people wouldn't say that they are. are there Some people would say they found them undependable. Are there additional ways in which God is able to guide our individual lives on a day-by-day -day basis? Does, does God somehow guide us? Well, he does guide us, I think, and it, it is good. It is very dependable, but I'm not sure if our interpretation is always that dependable. Yeah. God does not micromanage. Yeah. You, you, you've got to have freedom to make a choice. And sometimes we make the wrong choice, but we hopefully can learn. And sometimes the wrong interpretation will lead to the right interpretation after you've messed up. Yes. I'm not you sure know, Jonah so. would say God doesn't micromanage. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Jonah was a very unusual case, I think. Jonah was one of those stubborn guys that needed a little extra a little micromanaging <laughs> yeah exactly well, we got Balaam too yeah right yeah got, talking donkeys we got that young prophet that the older prophet lied to yeah. and we've got all kinds of prophets that did all kinds of things well Jesus said some words about wisdom and how you should follow along in God's path look at Matthew 17 13 and 14 go into the narrow gate because the gate to hell is wide and the road that leads to it is easy and there are many who travel it. But the gate to life is narrow and the way that leads to it is hard and there are few people who find it. Wow. Is that scary? How narrow Not is that positive. gate? Hmm? It's a negative way to look at it. I see. How, how narrow is that gate? Right. Did you have to squeeze through? I mean, uh, all you Maybe. need is big enough to walk through and... You're okay. <laughs> well, course, there's not too many people following you. Yeah, way. we're running out of time. How safe is it for us to do what we think is right? If we always did what we think is right. Well, when you're interpreting the scriptures, aren't you thinking then? That's, that's a little hard to say. I mean... Look, at there, there's twice in the book of jo Judges. You know, Judges is like the low point in scriptures. Twice in that, in that book, in, in chapter 17, verse 6, which I'm about to read, and in 20, ver 21, verse 25, the last verse in the book, it said, there was no king in Israel at that time. All the people did just as they pleased. pleased. Yeah. And if you go to the more traditional translation, each one did what was right in his own eyes. Is that a safe guide? No. Well, we were talking about the stuff that you can see and the things that you can't see. Yeah. And so we've got to take in the things that you can't see, and that's where the faith comes in. Yes. But we don't How many, need to see. I think, I think the inference there is that people were just doing whatever they wanted. Okay. <clears throat> they, were not, they were not consulting... Uh, Almost the spiritual resources that okay. were available to them. Almost every year, there's a major magazine that does a that does a, uh, a, a poll to tell us what kind of people do you trust? Do you trust used car salesmen? I don't even trust new or, car salesmen. Or <laughs> do you trust lawyers? Well, fortunately for me. Uh, Doctors are somewhere fairly high on that list. I guess people think they have to be if you're going to put your, trust your lives to them. I have no choice. <laughs> yeah. So how are we supposed to develop true, reliable, trusting relationships without at some time being too gullible? You have to experience. You have to have a relationship. You have to place your faith in... An individual, in this case we're talking about God, and mm -hmm. see how it works out. It's a, it's in a, there's lots of evidence, so to speak. There's also the experience. 
Yeah, you can, you, you're going to be gullible with some things. You just hope that the Lord's with you when you're doing it. Christ prayed all night. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us get close to that. Yeah. That's a big problem. If we put God first in everything we do, will we be safe? Even when we're gullible. We've talked about Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 to 30 already. This is what happens if you do what's right. This is what happens if you do what's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, God spelled out the results. And, and, and uh, you probably know that there are scholars who look at those chapters and say, those, those chapters could not possibly have been written before those events happened because they're way too accurate predicting what's going to happen in the future. Could, so therefore, it had to be written after, they, after the fact. So God's, God's prophetic foreknowledge is too good, right? Well, true wisdom includes an understanding of the great controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God. And I, we talk about that a fair amount. I, I hope that all of you out there have had some knowledge about that and, or you've had an opportunity to study it. Many of the stories in the Bible, such as the stories of Job and Abraham, when we, we, he was asking to asked to sacrifice his son, may seem puzzling without understanding that perspective. Caleb and Joshua, the two faithful spies in Numbers 13 and 14, and Elisha illustrated the value of seeing God's perspective on things. God knows everything about everything from the moment we are conceived until the time when we die. Look at Psalm 139. <clears throat> Nobody can fool God. He knows when those who offer prayer or worship are sincere or hypocritical. And... Uh, we're running out of time. Just as a suggestion, if you, if you wonder uh, what's the basis for trusting God, go to our website. We're not the only good website out there, I'm sure, but go to our website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and look at some of the comments about God. Look at the plans, that t the, the things that talk about the great controversies and scriptures and so forth, and see if taking that approach doesn't help you to have a better understanding of everything you read in, uh, about God, about God himself, I think it just helps me enormously <clears throat> in, in, in understanding God to, to, to have that. Um, things are very complicated in this earth, but God is, understands it all, takes it all in, and he will guide us the way we should go through all of it. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to Look at your word. Some of these things in Proverbs are a little hard to figure out, but we've uh, found our way through it. Be with our audience that they may perceive and understand and hear um, what, what we've talked about so they may become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name.